<coughs> this book has about 300 verses. 160 of them are warnings because of my weak human nature, because I like things easy, because it's so easy for me to drift and to neglect. More than half the verses in this book are warnings. God wants to save us from ourselves. We've looked at the first great warning with its unanswerable question, how should we escape if we drift away? I want you to look at the second and we're going to look at chapter 3 and verses 7 to 13. Hebrews 3, 7 to 13 gives us the second great warning in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. <coughs> As the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That's why I was angry with that generation. And I said their hearts are always going astray. They've not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they'll never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now note the 13th verse especially. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Notice the first word of what we've read, verse 7, today. I used to, when I was in evangelism, advertise a meeting, the fatal word that will fill hell. And of course, the fatal word that will fill hell is tomorrow. And the glorious word that will fill heaven is today. So here's a warning. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. How does God speak to us? Through the words of Christ, as recorded in Scripture, through the prophets, through his Spirit, as he brings to memory, to mind, the things we know are true. Sometimes he speaks to us through people and something they say links with conscience. Our conscience is only a good guide if it's been well educated. But even the worst of men usually know more about duty than the best man does. So God can speak to us through his word, through men. Christ said to his disciples, he that he is you, he is me. So God sometimes condescends to speak through a preacher, which does not make them infallible, which does not make them sinless. But it may be that the Holy Spirit may take something that is said by a preacher and you say, yes, I know that's true. Don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. Because if you do, you'll never enter God's rest. We'll talk more about that rest later. So in 12 he says, beware of a sinful, unbelieving heart, turns away from the living God. Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, while you've got a chance, so none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. This is a warning about being deceived by sin's deceitfulness. But sin never looks deceiving. Sin always looks good. When we sin, it's because we think we'll get something better. When we sin, we're choosing something that'll put us ahead, we think. Or we're avoiding something that'll put us behind. Now people question Genesis 3, whether it's true, the story of the first sin. Let me tell you, it's true at its deepest level. No psychiatrist, psychologist, scientist in the world could give us a better description of the course of sin and its folly than we have in chapter 3. Remember the devil comes beautifully attired, not slithering on the ground, and he can speak. He says, yea, as God said. In other words, what I'm going to suggest to you, there's nothing wrong with it. The first thing that sin comes to us is a lie saying, don't believe that this is unlawful. It's quite okay. Sin lies about its unlawfulness. It says to us, oh, has God said? No, no, no. The second thing is, sin deceives us 
by promising advantages that are not real and are not true. You'll be as gods. Instead, they became human and dying and subject to passion and pride and to everlasting loss. So the second lie in the deceitfulness of sin, it lies about what sin will give. You see, when you have sin, you have to ask yourself these questions. Was it as good as I expected? Am I a lot better off now? Has it satisfied all of me? Am I really better off? And the answer is no, you're not. Sin never profits. Sin is always a mistake. Then the third part of the lie, the first one was, look, it's not unlawful, go ahead. Second thing was, look, it's all advantage, all good. That's a lie. The third one is, you shall not surely die. In other words, no evil consequences from sin. That's a lie. All actions have consequences and all sinful actions lead to sorrow and sadness and loss. There's never any profit or any gain in sin. It never works. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. It always offers you something better, but it's lying. It always makes you blind to the consequences. Don't be deceived. It'll cheat. It'll tell you it's okay. It's not okay if it's against what God has said. <coughs> now would you kindly look at chapter 4. <coughs> Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest, which has just been mentioned, we read that in chapter 3, where it said in verse 11, I declared an oath, I'll never enter my rest. Now in chapter 4, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Now that's where I want you to stop and think. We who have believed enter rest. The cemetery lies on obelisk after obelisk. It is written, so and so entered into rest on this date. That's not what the Bible is saying. It says, we who have believed do enter into rest as soon as we believe. Now, today. The main reason for our restlessness is not the pelting of pitiful change and sorrow and pain. The main reason for our restlessness is not outward calamity at all. The main reason for our lack of rest is that we do not have a surrendered will. Here's a bird newly put into a cage. It doesn't like being in a cage. It bangs itself against the wires. It bruises itself. It may even bleed. And then it cows in a corner. If instead it said, well, I'm safe here from all my enemies and I'm going to be fed. I don't have to go around looking for food. This is glorious. It could sing. But as soon as it resists, it bruises itself. My friends, when we say yes to God, it brings repose because repose brings submission. May I say it again, not outward calamities bring us restlessness but the fact we do not have a surrendered will, that's what brings us restlessness. As soon as we say, God, if you do it, it's okay, and I'll sit back and accept it, we can sing. Like Silas and Paul in prison, bleeding from being whipped, they sing and there's a great earthquake, and their chains go off and they're free. And they win the jailer. Repose comes from believing. 
The believing in the New Testament means trust. Trust brings reliance, whether it's between husband and wife, mother and child. Here's a little child. Mother's hovering over it lovingly and the child goes asleep. Not only because it's ignorant, does it rest, but because it trusts. All reliance brings rest. When we rely on God, he will give us rest. But so long as we rebel against his providences, we will never have rest. Submission can take pain out of loss and crosses and the possibility of disturbing events to perturb us is vastly wiped out the moment we submit and rest in God. If I give you the name Princess Elizabeth, you will think of the present Queen when she was a young girl. Remember her? Very pretty, very lovely young lady. But I want to tell you about another Princess Elizabeth, the daughter of Charles I. Well, he was a bit of a scoundrel, but some bad fathers have good daughters, I know. (laughs) And this Princess Elizabeth, daughter of Charles I, had had a terrible interview with the father before he was, I think, beheaded. She's a Protestant. She's a believer. She is beautiful in spirit, but she's overwhelmed with sorrow for a while. And then when Charles II invades, she's moved into a prison on the Isle of Wight where her father had been before he was executed. And she's neglected. And she catches a chill. And she dies within a few days of being put in the Isle of Wight prison. And when they found her, her wan face was resting on an open Bible. And in the centre of the space where her head was resting were the words, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest promised in Hebrews is the same rest that Christ promised. It's a dual rest. It's a rest he gives immediately by taking away our guilt. Come unto me, all of you that are burdened with guilt, and I'll give you rest. That's the rest of forgiveness, rest of justification. Then he says, learn of me, take my yoke upon you, and you'll find rest. This is the second rest. This is the rest that comes from doing his will, from being obedient. So the Christian can have rest at the beginning and continually in the rest of the course of his life, in justification and in sanctification. If he submits if he trusts, if she submits, if she trusts. You've heard of Thomas Bilney, famous Protestant reformer at Cambridge, not knowing the gospel, deeply troubled in heart. His sin depressed him, went to the priest and they told him, take the sacrament, go to confession. He did it, did nothing for him. Then one day he came across the New Testament, just published in Europe, as a result of the work of the scholar Erasmus. And he opens it and he sees the verse, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And Bilney immediately found rest. You all know about William Cooper. When you were young you pronounced it William Cowper, but of course none of you would do that now. William Cooper, wrote those beautiful hymns about God's marvellous providences and many wonderful hymns. But in his youth, he had nervous breakdown after nervous breakdown. About to get married, nervous breakdown. About to face an examination as a lawyer, nervous breakdown. Finally, he cracks up and he goes into a mental hospital to be there for 18 months. He's overwhelmed with fear, fear of the judgment. Says to himself, let's eat and drink. Tomorrow I go to hell. And then walking in the garden of the mental hospital, he finds a Bible on a, on a bench and he opens it and these are the words he sees. God has set forth Christ as a propitiation for our sins through faith in him. Immediately the gloom lifted. 
Immediately the Holy Spirit gave him power to believe. Immediately he was fully sane again. He left that place to work alongside John Newton in producing some of the greatest hymns of the English language. In 1946, after going to a big library, Melbourne Public Library, finding a list of recommended books, I'd read a book on reliability of scripture, and I go to a nearest second-hand bookshop, I'd never been there before, up the staircase, looked like the old curiosity shop, big room full of theology books, no organisation, everything higgledy-piggledy, piled up on the floor, everywhere. And I spend a couple of hours there and I, I, find, I find some of the books I've just seen recommended. And one of the books was this one. I've had this book for over 60 years and this book is called Baxter's Saints Rest. Now, very likely you haven't heard of it, but this is one of the most famous books among Christian devotional books. Richard Baxter was a Puritan, a nonconformist, lost his job over it, government opposed him, danger of starvation, comes very, very ill, weeks on hovers on the edge of death, but the mercy of God he recovers and he begins to write what he'd thought about while he was near to death and this is what he wrote and the essence of it is this, God has given us a promise of an everlasting rest. But the millions of earth are looking for rest in thousands of places where it is not to be found. They look for rest in the love of a person, in securing a job, in becoming wealthy, in finding ease, and a thousand other ways. He says it always fails. There is only one way to rest, says Baxter, that is trust in the love of God as revealed on Calvary. Trust in the providence of God who makes all things work together for good. Augustine, centuries before, in his confessions wrote this, these words, God, you made us for yourself, but we are restless until we find rest in thee. We are restless till we find rest in thee. So the book of Hebrews is saying when we learn that God is very interested in us as though there was no one else on earth, just you, and he has a high priest that's caring for you, the writer is saying when you see that, when you believe that, your worries will go, sin will lose its power, your life will be different. You know you have an eternal inheritance. You know you're accepted of God even when you make mistakes. You know he's for you even in your sins and failures. He still loves you. All you have to do is look under him, seek him, and he will be found of you. This is only the way to rest. Look further in this chapter, please. <coughs> in this chapter... He contrasts Christians with the Israelites who were promised the rest of Canaan but when they got there they fell into idolatry and they had no rest of spirit. And so in Psalms God said they failed. But in the same Psalm 95 he had these words today if you'll hear his voice don't harden your hearts. And then it goes on to say verse 8 if Joshua had given them rest God wouldn't have spoken about another day. By the way, when you read a Greek Testament, it says, if Jesus had given, you, given them rest. Name Joshua is the Hebrew form of Jesus. There are three Joshuas in the Bible. The Joshua who led the people into Canaan, the promised land. The Joshua who rebuilt, helped rebuild the temple. And the Joshua, Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem. And in this part of Hebrews, the writer is saying, look, that first Joshua, who was a type of Jesus, because Moses couldn't take them in because he represented the law. You can never get in by the law. Joshua was a type of Jesus. He led them into the promised land. But they didn't enter into my rest because they fell into idolatry. 
So he's saying, look, Jesus is better than the prophets, first chapter, better than the angels, also in chapter 1, better than Moses, now better than Joshua. Soon you'll come and say he's better than Aaron. But look at the ninth verse. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so no one will fail by following the example of disobedience. This has great heights and depths, impossible to scale them, impossible to empty them. He's saying, look, remember, God worked and he rested. He's saying, look, when you come to Christ... You give up trying to work for your salvation. Just as God rested after six days of creation and entered into a period of rest, this is a symbolic language of Genesis 1, he's saying, so you, it's your privilege to give up depending on your activities. Give it up and enter God's rest. Then something else he's saying. He's saying the rest that is ours, the moment we receive Christ, the moment we believe in him, is a guarantee of the eternal rest. Some of your Bibles, if you have an NIV, talk about the Sabbath rest because a different word here in the Greek sabbatismo, different word here used elsewhere in chapters 3 and 4 for rest and it's saying, look, every Sabbath is a symbol and a foretaste of the great eternal rest. It is very tragic that the fourth commandment has been legalistically employed unless it is taught very clearly that the physical rest of observing the fourth commandment is just a symbol of the spiritual rest because we're trusting in Christ's finished work. Unless we do that, all we're doing is fostering legalism. The fourth commandment's about the gospel. Only God could create the world. Only God could redeem the world. Only God can give us rest. Stop trying to earn it by being a goody-goody and accept the gift. Enter into his rest by ceasing from your own works that try to earn what God wants to give you. But it has more meaning than that. He's saying when you really see the kindness and love of God towards you, you'll cease your works of sin. And by sin, the New Testament is particularly looking at deliberate course of disobedience. Even in the Old Testament, sins were divided into two classes. Sins of inadvertence, inadvertence, sins of ignorance, and sins with a high hand. And in the New Testament, it's made plain that while we are all guilty of sin type number one, sins we don't want to do but we fall into, I didn't mean to lose my temper today, but I did. I didn't want to grumble today, but I did grumble. I didn't tell the whole truth there. We all fall into these sins. New Testament takes that for granted. Read James 2. It says, In many things we all offend. In many things in innumerable things, because every thought by the law should be as good as Adam's before the fall, and no thought is. Every thought is tainted with selfishness, every thought, even after conversion. But the good news of the New Testament is these inadvertent sins of ignorance never bring condemnation to the Christian. Our failures, our mistakes, our lapses do not separate us from Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. Present tense, goes on cleansing like the lacrimal gland of the eye goes on washing the eye. So though I'm a sinner in thought, word and deed, I'm still accepted in the beloved and I'm counted as 100% righteous. But don't make the mistake of thinking that applies to a willful pursuance of a course of known sin that is different and that can separate us from God. And whatever we've done like that, we must cut off those works before we can enter into rest. So what have we learned from Hebrews today? I hope we've learned this, that while the world is a very delicate, dangerous place, 
And while God at times seems so far away that faith finds it difficult to struggle through to get him, yet we do have a great high priest. There has been a sacrifice for our sins. There are angels who care for us. There's the Holy Spirit who speaks to us. And there's a rest that's available for all of us, a rest for the taking, for the taking by weak, foolish sinners, you and me. Let's pray. Thank you for this book. We pray you'll make it speak to us, that we may walk in the light of it and we may rejoice in your kindness and enter into your rest. Amen.